Warning, listener discretion is advised. Hey, yo, man, we talk about spooky shit in here. Hey, what's up, you guys? Welcome back to the podcast. How are you doing? How is your mom? Am I asking too many personal questions? Am I making you feel nervous? Do you have anxiety? What's your favorite color? Who are you going to vote for? Do you like Missy Elliott? Who are you going to vote for? Anyway, today's episode is going to be a continuation of the psychic episode. Y'all reacted pretty well to that first part that I released last week. And um, I'm I'm going to finish with that story. Normally I would say, oh, I'll finish part two whatever day. And then I never get to it. Or I have it on the back burner. While I continue to give y'all new content, I'm going to, I'm going to follow through. I'm going to finish part two of the psychic episodes because y'all are really digging it. And y'all have questions and y'all want to know things. So <laughs> we're going to talk about that today and just some quick updates really. But first, let's pay some bills. Okay, you guys, now that that's over and done with, we're going to continue on this uh, two or three part series of the psychic episodes because y'all have been asking me questions. Y'all want to know if I am scheduling any readings. Y'all want to know if I got a message from your dead brother, even though I done told your ass I'm not a medium. And then... Y'all are having me interpret y'all's dreams and all kinds of stuff. So we're I'm going to answer some of those questions. I'm going to tell you what's what with those things. And then I'm going to continue on with all of the other receipts I have. And if this episode gets too long, there's going to be a part three. Because y'all responded pretty well to the first episode. So I'm going to keep giving y'all what y'all want. Personally, <laughs> I need to let y'all know before we get into that, that my professor and I have beef. We are the Tupac and Biggie of WT right now because basically Fridays we take quizzes in social psychology and there was a five question quiz on Friday and so I took it and then he posted the answers and our grades and all of that stuff and today he made the questions and the answers available to us. So being a nerd, I went to go see what that question that I got wrong was because I remember taking this quiz, it being very easy for me, except one question. And when I was reading this question, I knew it was going to be my problem child. I knew it was going to (laughs) be, I knew it was going to be my younger brother. (laughs) The question was like, I'm going to, I'm going to read it to y'all in a second, but the question was, ugh, and then the answers were, ugh, like they were all the same. So I take the quiz, miss the question. I'm a nerd. I want to know what the real answer was. I figure out what the quiz decided the real answer was, and then I throw a fucking fit. And I email my professor (laughs) because I'm a nerd and you're not about to give me a B in this class (laughs) because I answered this question correctly and someone else decided that wasn't right. I, mm, you better believe I use my super secret superpower of argumentation to get my fucking points. (laughs) I emailed him and let me tell you something when I'm, answering like essay questions, all of that stuff for school. I'm very official. I'm very, you know, I use, you know, proper language. I sound super fucking smart. I sound, you know, like the fucking professor. I sound like the professor's professor. So (laughs) I'm using my ghetto gay, very like I'm, I'm pressed just so I'm not editing myself and, you know, being, uh, concise and all of that stuff. I am, I'm pissed. (laughs) I'm like, sir, (laughs) I'm going to need you to do me a favor and tell me right now in here on this day, why this isn't the right answer to this question. Now, let me tell y'all what this fucking question was. This question was some fucking bullshit. The question said, Amy and Stephanie are getting ready for a test. They're both nervous And Amy, the little white bitch, tells this little Asian girl, Oh, you should be fine. You're Asian. Asian people are smart. 
And then the question asks, what is Amy? Racist! Racist is the answer. There's prejudice, racist, uh, overgeneralizing, or using a racial stereotype. The bitch is racist. So, seeing that is a problem, I put racist as my answer. And you know what the answer fucking wasn't? Racist. <laughs> the... <laughs> The answer was overgeneralizing, which I have a problem with because that's telling me that it is general. It's general knowledge. There's a general social consensus that Asian people are smart. So therefore, this Asian kid should do well on this test. So therefore, when Amy said, oh, it's OK, you should be fine. Asian people are smart that she wasn't being racist. She was just overgeneralizing. No, <laughs> negatory, the bitch, little fucking Amy was being racist, <laughs> and so I emailed the professor, and I was like, ma'am, <laughs> and it's a sir, <laughs> but of course, I don't care that other people in the world don't care about gender the way that I don't care about gender, I just assume everyone's okay with being called ma'am, so I was like, ma'am, I'm gonna need you to do me a favor, and tell me right here, right now, on this day, why... Racism isn't the answer to this question. I copied and pasted the question, and I said, because I am pressed and stressed about it. Thank you, Fonzie G. <sighs> Fast forward a few hours. I got the fucking points for that. <laughs> I made an A on that quiz. I got my 20 points. <laughs> because you're not going to sit here and tell me that little fucking Amy wasn't racist. And I even typed in the email. I was like, let's pretend... That me and a little black kid are getting ready to run a race. And it's me and little... And we're getting ready to run this race. And he is stretching. He's doing all of these things to, like, get ready for... He's breathing and all that shit. And I tell him, oh, it's okay. You don't have anything to worry about. You're black. And black people are fast. That shit's fucking racist, right? I gave him an example. I was like... Little fucking Amy's racist. If I'm racist telling that to the little black kid, Amy's racist for telling this to the little Asian bitch. <laughs> I got the points. <laughs> I made a hundred on that quiz. <laughs> he went in and, and fixed my grade. <laughs> because you were not about to tell me right here on this day <laughs> that little fucking Amy wasn't racist. <laughs> So I argued that shit. I argued that shit like a son of a bitch. I'm not going to argue. I'm not the kind of person that argues if there's a possibility I'm wrong because I don't like looking stupid. If I am right, though, and I know I'm right, I will fucking argue until the Lord comes back home. <laughs> I will argue until we are dead in the ground and bones. Oh, do not test me. <laughs> And, and this is my social psychology class. I, it's funny that I used all of that sassy gay slang in the emails while I was typing it out. And then I answer all of the weekly assignment essays, essay questions in very official, you know, professional lexicon. And, you know, I answer them like... A professor needs a student to answer a question with textbook words and terms and those smart SAT words. Like, I, I'm telling you, I look like the fucking doctor that wrote the damn textbook whenever I answer these questions. <laughs> and then, real quick, I was like, I'm going to need you to tell me right now in here on this day, honey mama, why this bitch ain't racist. Like, I... He probably thinks that I don't even do my work. <laughs> he probably thinks I pay someone to answer those questions. And that's why there's a difference between the, the verbiage I use when I'm sending an email and when I'm answering those questions. <laughs> but I really did. I argued that shit. I argued that shit so hard. But I got my points. So that's how you know I was right. Now... <sighs> They tried to tell me that, well, the reason that it's not racist is because prejudice is where you negatively impact someone for this ideal that you have about your... Yeah, I'm not going to give you all the definitions. The bitch was racist. <sighs> Overgeneralization, my ass. 
anyway, that's that me and me and my professor are beefing right now, but I won obviously because I got my motherfucking points. But for a second there, we were the Tupac and Biggie of that, that fucking university. I was, I, I don't know how far I would have taken that shit. I probably would have taken it to like the board of motherfucking directors, like the dean. I'd have knocked on the dean's office and been like, "Little Amy bitch is racist," and let me tell you why. And he'd have been like, "Who are you? <laughs> can can I help you? Yeah, of course. Go ahead and sit down. Like, yeah, I totally had an appointment today." <laughs> But yeah, I, I was very pressed and stressed today about that. <sighs> Had to calm down for a second. I was getting a little crazy. <laughs> and then another thing is that I very, I could have used one of our drop quizzes to completely erase this quiz grade. And I would still have an A in this class. <laughs> but I wanted all of the quizzes to be A's without drops. And then he w what would he use the drop quizzes on <laughs> if all of my quizzes for the semester were A's? Like, no. I could have very easily just let him drop that one because he, he drops two and keeps the other ones of the highest grades. But no, no. <laughs> I got that fucking question right. Anyway, apparently other kids were having problems too, so I guess everybody else got reimbursed for <laughs> points for it, that question if they got it wrong. But uh, yeah, I have, Ruth Bader Ginsburg would be very proud of me right now for arguing that shit. <laughs> I should write a dissent on Facebook <laughs> and email it to the dean and the head of the Department of Psychology at this... Ooh, oh, that's me being extra. Anyway... <laughs> this episode isn't even about that. I probably could have made it about that, but y'all deserve the second part to the psychic episode. And I'm going to start off by just saying that there's some questions that have been asked and I need to answer those. <laughs> and there's some clarification that needs to be made. And I don't know where to begin. I think I'll start with, oh, a lot of people have been asking me if I do readings, and I do do card readings, but due to the coronavirus, I've not, I've, I do not schedule appointments right now. Until further notice, I won't be scheduling a, a tarot card reading appointments. And I do interpret dreams. I, I do, I've had a good amount of dreams to interpret the last week. Y'all have kept me busy. I should start charging, though. <laughs> so there's that. Someone's asked me if I read tea leaves, if I read runes, or can throw a bunch of rocks on the ground, and then, like, depending on where they land, get a message. No. No. That Half of that shit isn't my area of expertise. There are other people... That's that's more like divination and witchcraft than it is just being psychic. And that's not my judge. Anyway, so I've had a lot of you ask for my services. I am not going to be taking appointments right now for everybody's safety. I'm not going to be taking epi uh, I'm not going to be taking episodes. I'm not going to be taking appointments right now just for everybody's safety. And anyway, receipts. So some of the first receipts I can offer have a lot to do with the fact that growing up as a child, something always just seemed to follow us around or haunt the places that I was living. And that me and my stepsisters and my step siblings, my step brothers, whenever my dad was married, my dad married so many fucking times. I have so many step brothers and stepsisters that you know, at the time were my legal stepbrothers and stepsisters. Now that my father isn't married, I still consider those people my step, well, at least Sapphire and Shania anyway. The other ones I was too young to, to form a connection with. And, and I think that my dad was married to their mother the longest amount of time. And because of that, they, you know, we went through enough <laughs> growing up together that we're just kind of, uh, bonded in that servitude of abuse <laughs> and so you know I, I still consider them both my stepsisters even though my dad and their mother have been divorced for years 
And any house that we moved to growing up, any fucking house, there was always something there. There was always something there, and I had a connection to it in a weird way. I I was always the one that got most of the stuff. I was always the one that it bugged the most. I was the one that discovered the... I don't know if the fucking CD player was possessed. I don't fucking know, but I was the one... Uh, I don't think I told that story in this podcast... You're going to have, I guest host two episodes on my stepsister Sapphire's podcast, Adventures Without Noodle Boy. It's available on Anchor. It's available on Spotify. It's on iHeartRadio 2 now, uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, anywhere podcasts can be heard. In one of the episodes, the spooky shit episode, we talk all about some of the, you know, kind of creepy stuff that happened to us growing up in the different houses that we lived in. And in this episode, I talk about how while we were moving in or while we were moving out, we found a Beavis and Butthead CD. And I put the Beavis and Butthead CD in my CD player. And I remember like it was (laughs) it kind of reminds me of bitch tracks. You know what a bitch track is where it's just like some, you know, generic music and then girls are talking over it. And just, it's a bitch track. (laughs) It kind of reminded me of a bitch track. And then I try and change it. And then the voices just, like, get pissed off at me. And I, like, it sounded as if they were being reactive to what I was doing. They were like, oh, why are you scared? Why are you changing the song? Why, what, oh, he doesn't think we're funny. Just going on and and stuff like that. And I got freaked out. I started you know, telling my dad, I grabbed my stepsisters, they heard it, like, the, it was a thing, and we, we, we tried to turn off the CD player, it would say stuff like, why are you turning us out, we, we're not going anywhere, yada, 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 and finally, my dad had to burn <laughs> the Walkman and the CD inside of itself, while the CD was in the Walkman, and then he threw the Walkman in the fire, because we had those like those metal barrels that are like kind of rested and you put them outside and then you put shit in them and light it on fire like a little bonfire thing. We had one of those barrels and he put it in there and he lit a fire and that's how he got rid of it. But I couldn't tell if it was possessed, but it didn't happen to any, any of the other people when they played that CD. It happened to me the first the very first time. And to this day, Beavis and Butthead scares the shit out of me. I am a grown ass woman. <laughs> I'm a grown ass man. <laughs> grown ass person individual human being and to this day Beavis and Butthead the show the cartoon just looking at them brings up the trauma and it freaks me out to this day <laughs> that's one thing that happened at one of the houses on Pine Street in Abilene it was actually someone had died in that house right before we moved in and you know we I don't know. I think that our fear raised the level of I think that our fear put that energy into the into the universe that you know kind of caused stuff to happen in that house, but I've since gone to therapy and spiritual healers and stuff like that. And they've told me that what was following us around wasn't, you know, a ghost. It wasn't, you know, some sort of weird demon. It wasn't just the fact that we were uh, moving into places that just happened to have something. What was haunting us was really just a physical, metaphysical manifestation of my father's inner demons. And it's very abstract as a concept. It sounds crazy. It's, it has nothing to do with psychic phenomena. It's more of a metaphysical, spiritual thing. But basically... My dad's anger and pain and trauma and his abuse stories and his demons, all the things that, you know, caused him to be the way he was, were physically manifesting into paranormal activity. At least that's what, you know, these people were telling me. And it kind of makes sense that those were manifestations of the evils that uh, he had inside of him because... Shit was always happening everywhere. We never lived in a place that didn't have something. 
And I've always chalked it to the fact that if, you know, spirits can feed off of energy, then m mad spirit, I don't know, mad spirits or mad whatever would feed off of his anger because he was always mad. He was always pissed about something. So I guess it, you know, gave them a good cornucopia of anger to continue to be fed by and gain energy from so that they could try and, you know, communicate or connect or whatever and then cause creepy shit to happen. But anywhere we lived, I, re I remember so many things. I have some written down somewhere. Hold on. Okay, I found it. So anywhere we ever lived, there was something there. I remember we lived in a townhouse in Abilene. It was me, my dad, his wife, my two stepsisters. And whenever we were downstairs, this is a two-story townhouse apartment. Whenever we were downstairs, there was always, 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 always footprints upstairs. And all of us would hear it when we were downstairs. We could all be sitting at the dinner table and we would just hear walking, like not even walking, like multiple people were running around upstairs and we lived, <laughs> it, it was a two story. That's all the apartment was. There wasn't stories of, of these two story apartments. It was the bottom floor, the top floor, and then air. <laughs> so there shouldn't have been anyone to make those footsteps of everyone's at the dinner table. Um, there was that and it didn't help at all that my dad was one of those people that sought out to piss off and invoke and provoke spirits and shit so he was always taking us like wannabe ghost hunting he would always like oh hey we should go to the Sim indian cemetery at night near L lake fort phantom and we should you know go down the tower and all all that stuff. He was always being a fucking idiot. We should go into the restroom at the lake where they say so and so died and like he was always being stupid. My dad was running my step grandpa, my stepmom's dad's wrecking service for a little bit and that we picked up some cars that people had died in traumatically, you know. We that there was this place was obviously very haunted. And when we would leave the wrecking service and we would go home, that stuff wouldn't stay in the wrecking service. There was always sounds and there was always shadows and there was always smells and there was always, you know, stuff like that going on. And I remember one specific day, there's one week in Abilene where all of the... Uh, wrecks that happen in town go to one specific wrecking service and then the next week a different wrecking service and then the next week a different wrecking service and it was our week and we were just up all times of the night every every hour or two someone would call us they would call us at two o'clock in the morning two o'clock in the afternoon they didn't give no fucks if there was a car that needed to be picked up they called Eagle Wrecking Service. And so I'm like nine, maybe fourth grade, not even. I'm like third grade. <laughs> I'm eight or nine. And I am waking up three o'clock in the morning to go help my dad grab a car, pick up a car that wrecked and someone died inside of it. And I'm going out there to help him do whatever he says dad was a fucking slave owner and i swear it <laughs> anyway one night i remember we were picking up a car that someone died in they'd already taken the bodies out they'd already cleaned the inside my dad told me to stay in the cab of the truck and this was a flatbed this is one of the bigger ones this wasn't one of those wrecking uh, trucks that, you know, has all those fancy hooks. It wasn't a mater looking wrecking truck. This was the big semi looking flatbed truck that we were in. And we, I remember we lived like three or four or five miles north of Abilene in a four acre plot of land that had goats and chickens and ducks and all kinds of stuff. 
There was a turkey. There was a pig at one point, but the pig kept escaping. I don't know how the fuck that happened. I'm pretty sure that pig was some Kung Fu Ninja type stuff. Anyway, we lived four miles north of town in a trailer that was converted into a house type situation. And there was four acres of land. It was outside of town. It was very quiet. People would think it was spooky, but it was just very calming out there. There was never, it never felt scary to me that we were all the way out there. If anything, I felt safer because we were in the middle of nowhere. But uh, if you know Abilene, you know what that means. (laughs) If you're from Abilene, you get that shit. Anyway, (laughs) we woke up. It was like three o'clock. My dad's like, uh, boy. He called me boy like we were in that fucking movie with Sandra Bullock and the kids. What's it called? Bird Box. He called. He always called me boy like we were in Bird Box because he couldn't remember my name or some shit. I don't know. <laughs> or he didn't want to get emotionally attached to me. He'd be like, hey, boy, wake up. We have a car. And so I'm eight years old. It's summertime. It's three o'clock in the morning. I'm like, okay, dad. And I'm wiping my eyes. I'm trying to wake up. And I get inside the truck and I'm half asleep. We are rushing down into the middle of Abilene. We even turn on the lights so that we could try to get there as soon as possible. We turn on the lights. People are pulling over for us. I only, I don't know why I remember this so vividly, but we get to the scene. It was somewhere down like, Judge Ely or Treadway. It was in that direction in Abilene. And it was on the south side. So we really had to drive. (laughs) We had to drive and we had to drive fast. And we got there because we had our emergency response vehicle lights on. And people were pulling over for us. And it's 3 o'clock in the fucking morning. There's no traffic. Anyway, we get there. My dad always told me the rule was that my dad gets off first. He sees what's up, he sees if it's safe, and if it's safe, I come down too. My dad got off, I stayed in the truck, I knew what the rule was. I stayed in the truck, didn't think about it, I fell asleep. (laughs) I'd hear him call me, he would wake me up if he needed me. And he goes back to the window, taps on my head like an asshole, like thumps me in the forehead or something. And he's like, stay in this truck, I got this one. And so, and it's because it was one of those cars, you know, one that someone died in. So I fall asleep (laughs) and I wake up and we're already at the wrecking yard and my dad's waking me up so I can help him put this car in the yard, lock the gate up and get back home. And so, you know, we pull in and, and I get out the truck and he has me get on the flatbed and help him do something so that he can lower the car onto the into the yard. You know, he can take it off the truck and, you know, put it in place in a parking spot somewhere and we could get the fuck out of Dodge. Well, this car refuses, refuses to get off the bed. We are pouring soap on the tire so it will slide off the bed. We put it in reverse, nothing. We put it in neutral, nothing. It does not want to, it doesn't want to get off. And these semi-flatbed, these semi-looking flatbed wrecking trucks, they have a flatbed that pivots upwards so that way the cars can easily be, um, easily be, drawn onto the truck and drawn off you know the the hydraulic system allows the bed to kind of angle so that way the cars can be pulled up into it and then it flattens and you know you can drive with it on this car refuses to get off the bed so my dad is you know pouring uh oil that didn't work my dad (laughs) pours soap and water that's hardly working finally he gets up there and we get up there and we are pushing this car off it comes off I stay on the truck to to clean up something, and there'd been blood, but my dad washed it away so that it wasn't dangerous or anything, and he told me to spray off the bed because we'd used all kinds of stuff, like oil, we used all kinds of shit, and so I sprayed the bed off while he was, you know, getting ready to lock up and stuff, and grabbing keys and getting paperwork done, and and it's, mind you, it's still, like, by this time, it's four o'clock in the morning, it's still dark, it's you know, third street of 
the south side of town in Abilene. It's scary outside. And <laughs> I'm washing the bed down. And my dad is getting ready to go into the office to get the paperwork halfway done. So that way he knows what's up the next day when he's ready to, you know, finish it. And I'm screaming, like, don't he fucking dare. <laughs> Not in those words, but I'm basically telling him, don't you fucking dare leave me out here on this bed with these cars, with all these fucking dead people. And my dad, tur my dad says that he turns around to look at me because he's going to yell at me for talking to him, back to him or whatever. And he sees a tall two times my height, a tall black shadow behind me. And to this day, the only reason I believe him, the only reason that I don't think that he just said that to scare me because I talked back to him is because I'd never seen my dad scared before. My dad was one of those macho men that you couldn't scare if you put a, a gun to his forehead. He He's not going out like that. He's going to fight to the death. He's not going to show you his he he was not one of those people. I'd never seen my dad's face go white. I'd never seen my dad's eyes get big. I'd never seen my dad be speechless. He always had some fucking shit to say, and that's where I fucking get it from. Anyway, all of these amazing traits <laughs> I'd never seen in my dad before, and I saw them that day. And I immediately feel something next to me, and I can see shadow, like a huge big black blob in the corner of my vision, and my dad's slowly walking towards the bed to get a hold of me. And I, I can't remember exactly what he told me, but he basically said, don't look. There's something behind you. Just, just come towards me. And so I start slowly walking towards, I freak the fuck out, but I'm slowly walking towards him. And my dad being six foot three and strong, <laughs> taller than me, built like a tree trunk. He grabs me uh, and picks me up, puts me down on the ground next to him. And we hightail it into the cab of the car and we leave the wrecking truck <laughs> in the yard <laughs> at the office with the bed still angled. <laughs> We leave it like that. We get in the car. We get in the truck that we drove from home to the wrecking yard to get the wrecker truck. And then we hightail it the fuck home. And we're both traumatized. And part of my trauma is having seen my dad so traumatized. Because, of course, when you're eight, you think your dad invincible. And then when your dad tells everyone he's invincible and everyone thinks your dad's invincible, you really be begin to believe it. So when your dad's afraid, you, that vision of a superhero in your mind is an abusive superhero, but that vision of a superhero is dead. And I'm telling you, my hair could have turned white that day. That's how just in shock I was because of fear because of all of those things. Like I was scared because my dad was scared. And then I was scared because of what I was seeing in the corner of my mind, what I was feeling, what I was sensing behind me. And in Latino cultures and in Italian cultures and all the, in different ethnic cultures, we have um, religion and then we have spirituality. And in a lot of, you know, Italian, Hispanic, um, gypsy, whatever time of culture you are, you have like, let's say you're Catholic and then spiritually you practice brujeria, santeria, voodoo, stuff like that, you know? And <laughs> we were very much those people. We, we were Catholic, we were raised Catholic, but if, you know, we thought we were cursed or something, we pulled out an egg <laughs> and we, you know, said a prayer and rubbed the egg over our body and we used, you know, holy oil and stuff to banish what whatever, whatever it was, but <laughs> everyone's got that one grandma in their family that when you're sick and you can't get rid of it, they come over with an egg or they come over with prayer oil or they come over with their little witchy stuff, their olive oil, and they, they take care of you. And then, you know, they either rub the egg over your body, they do ojo, and, and you're fine, <laughs> and they crack it into a glass of water, 
they you put it next to your bed while you sleep and all that stuff to trap the evil and banish it or whatever else they do. But everyone has that one grandma and my dad's mom was that grandma. So she did it. <laughs> she had to come over to our house because we couldn't sleep. Every time we closed our eyes, it was just darkness. My dad said that he started to hear like people moaning and groaning like they were in pain and agony and shit. And my dad believed probably to this day he believes that that thing was death incarnate looking for the soul of the person who was in the car that we picked up and i don't i don't know what you want to call it. i never even got a look at it so whatever my dad saw <laughs> whatever he heard whatever he felt when he looked at it i didn't i didn't grab a hold of you know i wasn't purview to those messages visions etc because i couldn't see it directly i could only f sense it next to me something very deep and and almost like a hole you could fall into and i just remember i just remember feeling this dark deep heavy hole next to me that if i took the wrong step i would fall into and then i remember you know the smell of like it smelled like gasoline or something it, probably sulfur but i don't know what sulfur smells like <laughs> so i've always just said like a gas like a rotten gasoline smell and yeah my my dad my grandmother had to um uh, i don't know what the exact word in spanish is called but we just call it mal de ojo and you rub the egg over your whole body and the purpose of this is that while you're praying whatever prayer you're rubbing the egg over someone's body as you pass the egg over that person's body, it's trapping the evil spirits that are cursing, influence, etc. The person, because the egg is a vessel, a pure vessel that the that the evil is being passed into. And then you crack the egg in water. In every religion, in every spirituality, evil can't flow through water, so it's trapped in the water cup, in the egg. And then, you know your connection to the evil that's in the egg over, you know, during the end of the night is all of the evil that was cursing you or whatever it was is slowly being drawn into that, um, egg that's in the water while you sleep. And then in the morning when the sun rises, you're supposed to bury it in the backyard or you get rid of it in flowing water. Some people, you know, flush the toilet, wait a second and then pour it in. So that, you know, the evil's carried away from your home. My grandmother had to do that three times. <laughs> because ours were cooked. The eggs were cooked after she would rub them over our bodies to trap the evil. We had so much of it. <laughs> we had so much of that evil. She had to do four or five eggs. She could have made an omelet, bitch. <laughs> and then that freaked me out even more. I remember my if something made my grandma nervous when it came to that stuff. It made me nervous, too, because one, I connected with those things. And two, my grandmother was this vision of someone who could fix anything like that. So if even she was nervous, she couldn't fix it. I was starting to get that anxiety that, you know, if she's nervous, <laughs> I'm extra nervous. And so, yeah, uh, that's one specific time when, you know, you could say I was inches from death <laughs> and not at my own hand. Something memorable. I'll never forget that story and exactly what what happened. And and I remember it was Tuesday. No, it, no, it was Thursday. It was. Yeah, it was Thursday. And the way this wrecking cycle was working for the city was that from Sunday, no, from Monday to Sunday, you pick up whatever cars they call you for, you bring your ass out here and pick them up. And it was a Thursday, and my dad called that morning and said, we're not finishing this week out. You give Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to somebody else. And my dad was not the kind of person to pass up work or money or anything like that. He would not have normal David would not have said that normal David that wasn't freaked the fuck out and scared for his life would not have said that at all. He would not have passed up those three days because I'm telling you there's cars, hours, 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 five, six, seven, eight cars a day 
and each of those cars can gross and make like $200 on average for the wrecking service. So my dad would not have passed that up, but he did. <laughs> he, he called City Hall and he canceled that morning. And that is something I'll never forget. And I remember that's a receipt, not so much for the experience of it having happened, but but my relation to what happened. The fact that I sensed that without seeing it, without knowing there was something behind me because I saw it with my eyes, I knew that there was something back there because I felt it psychically, cosmically, spiritually. I There was, it felt like, I was at the end of a cliff, and if I took the wrong step, I would fall. Even though I was on this big old flat bed that I could run around six feet in any direction and be just fine, it it scared the shit out of me, the living shit out of me. And the fact that I felt that there was the first, like, huh. I, I did feel like... It, I, it caused me to have a sensation of almost falling, even though I was on flat, uh, on a flat bed, a big flat bed. And that's one, <laughs> that's one. And then, let's see, ooh, Taco Bell. Taco Bell, <laughs> here in Hereford, Texas, where I worked for three years, three and a half years, haunted as fuck. Haunted as fuck. Some of the supervisors that had been there for a while before I finally got there told me that there were the, there'd been a gentleman who was walking across the street and this is on a highway. So it's a two way two lane two way highway through the city. It's the biggest <laughs> widest road in this little town, this little cow town in Hereford, Texas. And he's on US Highway 60. He's walking across the street to I guess go back to his semi or wherever he was going he gets hit by a semi and is thrown to the onto the lawn and dies right there in front of everyone and the supervisors will say that you know when he got hit he got thrown into the Taco Bell the the land (laughs) that Taco Bell sits on he got thrown into the lawn so he haunts that place But what I know (laughs) is after all of the experiences, all of the things that I, you know, put up with there, I've got some stories about Taco Bell. And there is there wasn't just that one guy either. I, I know that he did haunt that place because I'd had experiences with, you know, a man that fit that description and a man that gave me the sense of all of that stuff. But there was at least four four different um <laughs> beings spirits something in Taco Bell because like um oh there was I know there was an old man because people talk about seeing an old man the workers and it's always at night oh it's always at night when night or or early in the morning before the sun comes up and you know the breakfast people are getting ready for prep and stuff to open the store but uh, there was an instance where I was cleaning. I I stayed late, and I stayed to clean the grills on a Friday because Fridays I worked Monday through Friday, and Friday I worked nights on Fridays, and <laughs> I would wait until the end of the night to start cleaning the restaurant. The grills the stainless steel grills that we cook everything on there's uh, two press grills at the end and then one big uh tortilla warming grill i don't know what you call that but it was my job every day to make sure that those things got cleaned and so i on fridays an hour before it was time to go would start cleaning them it would take me until everyone was done closing and then sometimes i would have to stay a little bit later and on my own continue to clean those grills because everyone left (laughs) everyone would leave when they'd done closing but if i wasn't done and people were done closing i had to stay there by myself and i having already on multiple occasions seen things seen people seen ghosts but i while cleaning these grills 
on two separate occasions, very vividly saw black shadows walking past where I was adjacent to the the cooking fast food line that, you know, is in the back house of every single Taco Bell. It's like double-sided. It, it has your meats and your rice and your beans and your nacho cheese and your red sauce. It has all that stuff and then a hot grill and then you move over and there's your vegetables and then up top there's like taco shells and taco salad bowls and all that stuff and then finally at the end towards let's say the ordering booth or the ordering kiosks and towards you know front counter and and towards the drive through window there were two more grills that were press grills like for burritos if it was a grilled or something like that and on many different occasions while I was cleaning those grills normally by myself or with you know young naive kind of impressionable scared (laughs) people that are easy to scare (laughs) I didn't want to see like I didn't want to say like hollow (laughs) not much going on upstairs Because none of these people were stupid. Got on my nerves, but they weren't stupid. But, you know, people that were easily... um, People that were easily impacted. And so, I remember cleaning a grill and just something black looking like it was walking past. Like Bigfoot. Like Bigfoot, but it was a shadow and it walked past in front of me on the other side of the line where I could see from where the grill was but you know i don't i don't even know how to word what i'm talking about right now but there's a little window there's little areas where you can see from one side of the line to the other side of the line and one line on one side is for like drive through and only drive through stuff is done on that side and then you have another side that's like dine in and then when we're busy Dine inside does dine in stuff, drive through side does drive through stuff, and then when dine in isn't busy, they'll help drive through. And they face each other these lines. At least in my Taco Bell they did. And you could see through to the other person on the other side of the line. If you had to, you could easily talk to them. Well, on this Friday, I'm the only person in the store. I am by myself on one side of the line and I'm cleaning the grill on that side and then on the from the little areas the little see-through tunnel looking windows where you would normally be able to talk to the person on the other side I see black shadows walking through and no one else sees these things (laughs) no one else could It, it was a me thing it was specific to me I saw them There was one day when I had people in the restaurant when I saw it. And I remember being so afraid that it it was to a shock that I had fallen to the ground. Well, tried to run out the back door, fallen. And then instead of getting up and running out the back door, started to crawl out the back door (laughs) very dramatically. But it it was because I saw it and the other people didn't see it. And I, I don't know, I got a visual message from that energy and the other people didn't. And it's because, you know, it's easier for my radio to frequency to pick up on stuff. If you see psychic ability, if you see psychic ability as like a radio frequency and the ghost as a station, I could just pick up on that station and everyone else around me couldn't. And that's why it had shocked and kind of scared me so <laughs> Everyone else said, I didn't see anything, but I did. And it was very vivid. And someone, it was so, it existed so firmly to me in the world that my vision perceives that I thought the person that was walking towards the shadow that was walking away from me was going to bump into someone and fall to the ground. But that didn't happen. And that was an example of 
a visual message that I got because no one else saw it. So that energy was able to send me the visual message of something being there because of my psychic proclivity towards clairvoyance. Now, now <laughs> I have all kinds of supervisors that have had their own specific, you know, experiences throughout the restaurant. And, you know, I'll... <laughs> Oh, I remember a good one. Oh, Lord Jesus Almighty. Oh, but this isn't even a psychic thing. This is more of just like a scary, like a spooky shit, something that was scary that went down at Taco Bell. But it doesn't have to do. It's not a receipt for me being psychic. Like, oh, this thing happened. So I'm psychic. But no, <laughs> this spooky, scary fucking thing happened at my Taco Bell. And... <laughs> everyone it happened to everyone everyone saw it uh, me and the front counter girl were the ones it happened to so it wasn't specific to me <laughs> I had this little girl named Gabby working for me and it was getting ready for us to close the lobby the lobby closes an hour before drive through at this Taco Bell and so in that hour before drive through closes, but after front counter's already been closed, the front counter person cleans up so that way they can go home. And it was getting, <laughs> it was becoming time to start cleaning the restrooms. And so <laughs> she had asked me what chemicals I wanted to use on what, and she'd gone over there. She had this little, like, hand-carrying pail type cleaning house cleaning chemical organizer thing that she would carry from the back of the house to the front and it had all the stuff she needed in it and <laughs> I'm getting nervous just talking about it I'm like already losing my breath she <laughs> put the okay so in order to prop the door open you have to put one of those triangle things underneath it well, we had some very good ones because our doors had kickstands and there was grooves in the floor. And if you push the door back, the groo the little kickstand would catch in a groove and it would, you know, a grown ass woman <laughs> couldn't get that door to shut on them. Gabby walked in there, put that pail slash, you know, cleaning supplies carrier thing that she had on the floor near the toilet she was like oh I forgot something I w she went to go grab me and then she walked in the restroom and starts freaking out and she tells me that she goes in there and she notices that this big heavy maroon I don't know how to describe it I want you to think about like a like a deep tray that you can put, you know, bottles of cleaning supplies in there and gloves and sponges or scrubby things like green scrubbies in and then carry with you with a handle in the middle. That's pretty heavy. It had bottles full of chemical in there. It had boxes of gloves, all kinds of stuff. A roll of paper towels could fit in there. And she put it Right by, right next to the toilet. Because she, she always liked to clean the toilets first. And she started screaming because she noticed that the, <laughs> she noticed that that pail had been moved from right next to the toilet in this rather big public restroom where there's only one toilet. All the way to right inside of the door. Like, it's right in front of the door. And she is freaking out because there's only five of us. She's the fifth person. The other four of us were in the back the whole time trying to get these fucking orders out. And on my eyes, we were busy. Like, there's no way that any four of those people would have been able to do, like, a prank on her because... Would have been able to pull a prank on her because we were busy and I'm not gonna let those orders come out late because we want to do some, you know, we want to play some funny little trick on this girl. 
and she's screaming. She grabs me. She takes me. She shows me exactly what happened that had been moved from here to here and all of that stuff. She's screaming and we are about 10 feet out of the front door. <laughs> 10 feet out of the front door in the lobby area and she's freaked out and I'm kind of excited because I like shit like this. And then we hear that pail drag across the floor of the tile, hit something, and then the door slams. <laughs> and she is screaming. She is screaming. She is screaming. And even I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> but I'm not like, ah! like, I'm not screaming. But, <laughs> but I'm surprised. And I'm... <sighs> I finally grab the courage to, I get the courage to open the door, which didn't take very long because I'm not a scaredy cat or nothing, but I get the courage to open the door, uh, ask her if this was the big joke that she was trying to play. And she said, no fun. Like she threw tears. She's screaming at me like, no Fonzie. I put it right here and then it moved right here. And then I came to grab you and show you and all that stuff. She told me the story again. And then, you know, that's when me and her were over there. We heard it drag across the floor, hit the wall, I guess, because when we opened the door, it was right next to the wall that the door closes to. <laughs> like you walk in and boom, right behind you on the right side, it was on the on the floor right there. And <laughs> she was freaked beyond. <laughs> I think she forgot how to pray. This girl was very religious, but she forgot there was a Jesus for two seconds because she was so scared. And I was more like kind of shocked for two seconds, but I was more excited than scared, scared. <laughs> and to this day, I will never forget that because what was most memorable to me was Gabby's shrieks of fear. Because she knew that the four of us were working and that where she'd put it, because she always put it in that one spot, the floor wasn't wet. It was too heavy to slide on its own, even if there was like a little, like a drain indention in the floor so that water could flow down. Like, no, none of that. There was no way in hell that it was moved unless a ghost moved it. And there was no way in hell, especially, especially while I was there as a witness that anyone was in that restroom when it got dragged across the floor the, le the rest of the way and that door slammed. <laughs> and, you know, I've asked the spiritual healers I talked to and all of that stuff, and they've told me that, you know, spirits, If I know I sound crazy, but if you listen to the first one, then you're interested at least. When spirits will use psychics as a beacon to get energy from because our psychic energy flows through our physical plane and the spiritual plane. So in the same way that fear and anger can fuel a ghost or an evil spirit or whatever, me just living my life and breathing <laughs> can fuel and energize a ghost, a spirit, whatever. Because they use that energy that I put out into the world to energize themselves enough to send me messages. According to the other psychics, the, the spiritual healers that I've spoken to, according to them, me, I, I can't say it does happen, but I can't say it doesn't happen either. And that's not exactly what's going on whenever I get these messages and stuff. But I specifically remember that day whenever all of, while all of this was happening, I was talking, a little girl was talking to me in my head, like someone my age, someone like 20, it it didn't feel like an old lady, but it didn't feel like a little baby girl or either, like a four-year-old, it felt like 16, 17, 20-year-old, somewhere in there, and I remember I just kept seeing a maroon lady in my head, a, a lady wearing like a pink shirt or a pink sweatshirt or like a maroon, like something red tone related, and... I remember exactly what she looked like because pictures of her would pop up in my head while Gabby was talking to me and all of this stuff would happen. And I'm telling everyone in Taco Bell and another person says, oh, yeah, I've I've seen someone that kind of reminds me of that. And they say that one time they were standing on the dining line 
which looks into the lobby. And they were talking to someone who was grilling a burrito. And behind the person that they're speaking to, they see a little girl in a hoodie just standing behind them. And then she looks and she looks away and she looks back like a quick double take and she's gone she's like i've seen someone like that she has short hair kind of to her clavicles her her collarbones and i'm like yep yep like i'm explaining everything and she said oh yeah i know her that well i've seen her i don't know her but i've seen her and i was like you're a receipt (laughs) you're a receipt so if you're ever in her for texas you drop by taco bell and ask them about the ghosts and someone will come out and talk to you about it someone will because anytime someone said oh hey i was i did someone you know tap me on the on the shoulder when i was you know checking my emails because i turned around and no one was there was it one of y'all playing a trick on me and we're always like no it wasn't it was probably so and we'll just start talking about all the stuff and get excited because you know it's cool <laughs> so if you're ever in Taco Bell, I I'm going to use the entirety of Taco Bell as a receipt that this spiritual phenomenon had happened because <sighs> there was no way that wasn't something. Now, more more psychic related. Um I have a friend, we've talked about Moran before. She was working at a place in Amarillo called Guitars and Cadillacs. In Guitars and Cadillacs, there's, you know, a bunch of waitresses, well, table runners. There's a bunch of table runners, and then there are a group of badass um, bartenders, and then there's, you know, bar runners in the back that are grabbing stuff for people and whatnot. And there was a girl that worked there with my friend Moran named Dee Dee. I'm going to call her Dee Dee. I'm not going to use her real name. Because I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if she'll be all right that I'm telling the story. But Dee Dee had recently, you know, lost some people in her life. And Moran was like, oh yeah, talk to Fonzie about it. <laughs> like just volunteering my services as some sort of liaison to the other side. And I've told y'all, I'm not a medium. I'm psychic. I'm not a medium. I can't communicate with the dead. I can't communicate with the other side anyway. And it's definitely not a direct line. Like any time I've communicated with something or got a vision from something or got a spiritual message, it wasn't a two sided. It wasn't something intelligent on the other side sending me the message trying to communicate through signs and symbols and stuff like that. It was my precognition picking up on things that were going to happen or things that related to knowledge and information. There's a difference between being psychic and being a medium is because when you're a medium, there is a spirit sending you information like, Oh, tell them. Let's say that spirit is a daughter and a baby girl that had died and, you know, couldn't grow up And, you know, this family has always wanted to communicate with this little baby girl. And the baby girl will send the medium a, like a baby doll and a pink blanket and like a crib. And that is a, is a psychic message to the medium from the little girl so that the medium can tell the family, like, this is what I'm picking up. Did you have a... A baby girl who, like, let's say, didn't make it. Do you have a baby? Do you have a daughter on the other side? Like, stuff like that. He is a psychic and he is a medium. If you put a psychic in that place, the difference becomes that if the psychic gets or sees a baby blanket or sees a pink, some like, crib sees these things it's not because it's coming from spirit it's because it's coming from that psychic psychic ability you know if you're not a medium then there's not something on the other side feeding you this information so i've made it pretty clear i don't think i'm a medium that's not a muscle i've decided to flex yet um i will however you know 
there are some, I have some medium-like tendencies, especially when it comes to personal family members that I knew well. I can, you know, get signs and symbols and stuff and messages from them in a more symbolic code type way. For example, my grandmother's fiance, he was a veteran's sniper in Vietnam. He, you know, he was the coolest special ops thing you ever seen your whole life. He told me things he probably shouldn't have. He was, he was great. He was amazing. He just was with my grandma for 14 years. They lived up up, in upstate New York. He never married her, but that was still my grandpa to me because I was 22, 23 when he died. They were together for 13 years. That was a huge percentage of my life. That man was my grandpa. One of them anyway. (laughs) And to this day, when I'm getting ready to do like a big road trip or something, if I'm getting ready to like leave town because I'm going to Dallas for this, or I'm going to New Orleans, or I'm going to Riadosa for the weekend, um, I always put my music on shuffle. I always put my music on shuffle on Spotify. I have like (laughs) 10,000 songs on Spotify in my shared music. And only one of these songs is Gypsy by Fleetwood Mac. But every time I put my music on shuffle to get ready to drive out of town to start this road trip, any road trip, that song is always the first, second, or third, or fifth song that plays in the shuffle of 10,000 plus songs. And that is always my message from Gypsy that he's got my back, he's watching over me. You know what I mean? So that is how I connect with Gypsy. And I, you might notice in your own life that let's say you have a grandma who loved butterflies. And then after she passed, God rest her soul, butterflies follow you around all the time. Everywhere you go, there's a butterfly in the spring. They won't leave you alone. You can't sit outside without a butterfly being somewhere. You can't get ready to take a shower without a butterfly being on the window in the restroom. That That's your grandmother. You might start picking up on those types of things. I know that the day my mother dies, if frogs start showing up <laughs> In my yard, I know it's my mother because my mother loves frogs. She's always loved frogs. So I will know the day my mother dies, God forbid it happens anytime soon, that if I get visited by frogs for absolute no reason, I never see frogs in the yard. (laughs) Never see frogs in the yard. I live in Texas. It's too dry for frogs in the yard. But I know that if I ever see frogs start showing up for no reason somehow, It'll be because, you know, that's my mother trying to connect with me and let me know that, you know, she's there. But for a psychic medium, they don't need those specific signs and symbols. They can get that information through their psychic senses from an energy on the other side, feeding them that information that they would not know. I am not a psychic medium because I have not found yet a way to raise my energy level to <laughs> to meet or to receive information from the other side in that way. Anyway, all of this to say that I'm not necessarily a medium. As an example, I there's been instances like the one that I'm about to tell you about where I'm not communicating or the the individual in question isn't who's feeding me this information, but because I'm psychic, I am connecting to the person that I'm doing the reading for, and their energy is giving me this information. Uh, Someone who is alive, I am picking up on their whatever, you know, maybe their pain for a lost loved one, and then that's how I'm getting these messages. But Dee Dee, Worked with Moran, worked for Moran, was one of the waitresses of this club that Moran was the head bitch in charge of. And she'd been through something. They didn't want to tell me what, so that way, you know, I didn't have any information that would kind of cloud or provide a bias for whatever she needed to know. So I picked her up. I guess she needed a ride home or she needed a ride something. She t- Moran told me to pick her up and do something, bring bring her to her house or something like that. So I did because I was out and about. And so I picked her up 
And Dee Dee told me <laughs> that she needed me to do her a favor. And I said, well, hey, I don't pay for it, but. <laughs> and she said, no, not that. And she said, I need you to, you know, do a reading for me. And I was like, I knew this was going to happen. She said, because you're psychic, right? Rand told me. I said, no, because when you, I knew what your energy was like whenever I was getting ready for this. Anyway, I start trying because I'm not a medium, but I start trying to figure out what had happened because the way that she approached me wasn't so much that, you know, she wanted to communicate directly with the spirits of who she needed to speak to, but it was kind of like a test. I think it felt more like a test because I was picking up on things that weren't necessarily messages. You know, uh, I don't get their feelings. I don't get messages like, you know, you'll watch TV and see mediums that say, oh, and she wants me to tell you this, or she wants me to tell you that you were the best, whatever. She wants me to tell you that, you know, she always loved you. She's so proud of you. I don't get any of that. What I see are pictures or visions of things that confirm the information that I'm telling the person. So I told Dee Dee, you lost like your baby's father. And you lost people, you lost multiple people one after the other, I told her, because I feel like it's pow, 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 like this happened, this happened, this happened, and it just all happened at once or very quickly together. Like you didn't have time to process the last one because the next one was coming. And then, you know, she finally like broke down and she was like, yeah, my baby daddy. And then my dad died very close together and then a friend or something like that. And I was like, okay. And I said, you know, was it like a tree? I, I feel like there was a wreck and someone wrecked in, into like a tree. And it's like, and I'm feeling a pain in my head. And then I was explaining to her what I was feeling. And she was like, yep, this, yep, that, yep, this, yep, this. And she's like, I just want to know, you know, these things. And I was like, I can't, I, I, I'm not. I'm not getting those types of messages. What I'm just seeing what happened because I'm psychically connected to what happened through you, not through, you know, the spirit of these people on the other side. And so she was kind of disappointed in that way, but I was verifying everything. I got everything down from, you know, car crash, tree, one, two, three, you know, her baby daddy, her dad, her her best friend, like I got all of those details that I did not know because Rand knows better than to give me information that I do not need because I need to work that process out on my own. And so Ran <laughs> for this story as well as another person that I present to y'all as a receipt <laughs> of my psychic ability because like I talked about in the last episode, she's always believed in it far more than I ever do. And she's always bringing me dreams and bringing, uh, bringing me dreams to decode and decipher and bringing me this, like, Oh, is this a sign? And, and, uh, what, Oh, uh, oh I got a friend that needs to know this and <laughs> just pipping me out psychically. But she is someone that <laughs> I, I should probably ask her if I can link her Facebook profile. <laughs> No, if y'all were smart, y'all could just find my Facebook profile, look at my friends, and then search for a Moran in there, and I'm sure you'll find her. Anyway, yeah, that that's another instance of of when I use, you know, my psychic gifts to, you know, get some information correct. And god damn, this is an hour and 17 minutes already, and I feel like I didn't even say all that much. I guess there's going to be a part three after all, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for, you know, listening to this entire episode. I know it it kind of rambled on there for a, a little bit, but I'm going to edit it down. Hopefully it's not an hour and 17 minutes by the time you get to it. And I will see y'all for part three soon. Bye. With that being said, we've officially made it to the end of Ask Fonzie Anything. Thank you so much for sticking with me through this entire episode. If you want to hear more, I have tons of episodes posted already, and I'll post new episodes whenever I want.
No, but seriously though, usually Mondays, and when the show starts growing, I'll start releasing episodes twice a week or something. If you like the show, it is available almost everywhere podcasts can be heard, including Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Make sure you add, like, subscribe, or follow me on my social media profiles. It's at Fonzie Graziano on everything, so you don't have to worry about missing an episode. Make sure and send me DMs to request episode discussion topics. You can write in to me if you need advice. I've been told I'm an infinite spring of wisdom. I can definitely give you an outside perspective. I'll tell you what I would do anyway. And who knows, your letter might be the one I answer in the next episode. Uh, If you like, you can directly support the podcast. There are links in the bio to my Patreon and Anchor Direct. Or you can just buy one of my books, my first book, Glory, is available in print on Amazon.com and Walmart.com. The ebook is available on Kindle, and there is an audiobook available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes.com, I think, but don't quote me on that. Also, my second book, Raindrops and Other Lullabies, which was originally due for release earlier this year, but it's been pushed back twice due to the coronavirus. It'll definitely be out before the end of the year, though. Uh, If you go to my website, not only can you download and read PDF previews of both books, but you can also listen to a sample of the audiobook of Glory, and if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get an exclusive updates on what I'm working on and promo codes and sales and discount info. And last but not least, I just want to remind y'all to be a rainbow in somebody's cloud, be kind to yourself and others, unless they talk to you crazy, and wash your fucking hands and wear your goddamn mask. I want to go to the bar. We'll get through this together. (laughs) Thank you for listening. I think you're pretty cool. I don't care what they say about you. Bye.